Good evening, everybody. My name's Dr. Joe McGurr and welcome to the Net Zero Emissions webinar for this evening. We're just about to get underway and we're just waiting for the last uh, of our attendees to log on and get themselves settled and comfortable and ready to go. So if you'll just uh, bear with us for just a couple of minutes, uh, we will then kick off proceedings. Just imagine it's uh, a bit like a late start to a theatre show and just waiting for those people who arrive late and the lights are dark and have to be ushered down to their seats. And I know that's a bit irritating, but we all do it because we just don't want it to happen through the performance. So uh, just imagine it that way, even though it's a virtual system. And of course, hopefully those days of going back to the theatre won't be far away. Anyway, so we'll just wait a little bit longer for folk to get settled and we'll be underway. And I'm really looking forward to this evening. We've got some wonderful presenters who are going to set the scene for our discussion. And I'm really looking forward to getting the questions and the feedback from uh, the attendees. And we'll explain how you do that in just a moment. So I'm just getting settled now and uh, we won't be long. As I say, we're just waiting for the last folk to come in. If I lower my voice, I feel a bit like one of those cricket commentators, just waiting for the start of the last over before stumps. No, we're ready to get underway. Okay, so let me welcome everybody uh, to our webinar on net zero emissions and what our community can do. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. And can I begin, first of all, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we uh, are, those of us who are not on Wiradjuri land, I acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of your lands, but uh, for me, it's the Wiradjuri people and I wanna pay my respects to elders past, present uh, and emerging. As I say, thank you very much for joining us for this webinar this evening. Uh, the purpose of the webinar is to raise awareness of this issue of net zero emissions and in particular raise awareness of the potential for a community strategy in relation to that and raise community awareness of what actions can be taken and support our local and state governments in taking their actions. So it's really about putting the agenda out there, getting people thinking about what action they can take and how they can also uh, work with government uh, and frankly, hassle government uh, to get on and, and take the actions that we need to take uh, to make sure that we have net zero emissions. Now, we have uh, a wonderful group of speakers this evening and uh, I will introduce them uh, each in turn, but I do want to at the start uh, acknowledge that Bayhad Jafari, the CEO of the Electric Vehicles Council has been unable to join us this evening. They had uh, and his wife are expecting uh, their first child very soon. And they had actually had to pull out uh, literally yesterday. And he's arranged for Alex Kelly to join us, who is a uh, policy manager with the Electric Vehicles Council. And I'll introduce Alex a little bit later, but she stepped in at the last moment. We were talking to Bayhead about the seminar literally earlier in the week. So I want to just acknowledge Alex and thank her for uh, her um, joining us this evening. Now, very importantly, during the presentations, there is the opportunity for you to participate and we're very keen for this to happen. So on your screen uh, next to the presentations, you will see another screen uh, with the words, ask the speaker on it and a box where you can type your questions. Uh, now, throughout the webinar, you can ask questions using that function uh, and questions that are submitted will be shown on the screen and you can actually upvote them. So if you click on a question that interests, if you see a question, sorry, that, that interests you, click the thumbs up button and that will push the button, push the question up to the top of the list. And that way we'll make sure that we uh, address the questions that uh, uh, if you see most people in the audience, uh, the greater majority of people in the audience are interested in. All right, so I'm very uh, pleased tonight to be joined by uh, William Adlock, who is president of the Climate Rescue of Wagga Group. William, good evening. 
Uh, it was the Climate Rescue of Wagga who came to me with the idea of hosting a seminar like this, and I want to thank them for their input, and thank you, William, for your help in presentation. Mm -hmm. William and I will be uh, sharing the questioning, reading the questions at the end of the uh, presentation, so I'm looking forward to that, William. Thanks. Okay, so we might get underway. Um, our speakers are uh, Kartik Madeira from the Department of Planning, Industry and Environment, Carly Hood from Wagga City Council, and as I said, Alex Kelly from the Electric Vehicles Council. And I'm going to begin by introducing uh, Kartik. Uh, Kartik is in fact the coordinator of the New South Wales government's net zero emissions program, designer and coordinator. He works in the Department of Planning, Industry and Environment. And Kartik is going to provide us with a presentation that uh, I guess provides an outline of the New South Wales framework uh, and its connection to bills and legislation um, and he will focus, uh, I think, on some programs around waste and energy in particular. Katik, can I hand over to you now? Sure. Thanks very much for the introduction. So I will start, uh, just make sure I'll share my screen. Excellent. So I would also like to begin by acknowledging uh, the, the acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather today and pay my respects to the uh, elders past, present and emerging. And I'm presenting here from the uh, Darig land. So as Joe mentioned, my uh, presentation, what I'm going to do over the next couple of minutes, just give you a quick overview of what the policies and kind of initiatives the state government, the New South Wales government is kind of working towards uh, transitioning towards net zero emissions. So um, most of you may have heard, or if you haven't, uh, last year, um, the government launched its uh, net zero plan. Uh, which may under which the government made a commitment to reduce to transition towards net zero emissions by 2050. And earlier this year, I think it was very recent, I think in June this year, the government increased its target to um, no, 2030 target to halve, emission, halve its emissions by 2030 on a 2005 level basis. Um, what the net zero plan does, uh, basically it, it kind of lists all the programs to be delivered under four key priorities areas. So as you see on the screen, there are uh, the first priority is driving uptake of proven uh, emission reduction technologies. So that could be like EVs or other energy demand reduction technologies. The second priority which the government is focusing or will be focusing on is through empowering consumers like you and me or even businesses to actually make informed choices to um, transition towards net zero emissions. The third and the, I think my personal, uh, my personally most, most exciting phase is the in, is investing in the next wave of emission reduction technology. So that could be like technology like hydrogen or investing in research and development, which could actually really identify those technologies which haven't yet been uh, uh, found. And last but not the least, the most important step is also equally that the government is leading by example. Uh, so that is through the initiative such as installing solar panel systems or other renewable energy technologies on government owned assets, or even transitioning our government fleets like, you know, buses to electric. Uh, so how the government is actually achieving uh, some of those goals. So basically there's an zero plan and uh, again, last year, towards the end of last year, just before Christmas, the government uh, passed the legislation uh, introducing the electricity infrastructure roadmap. And this is one of the cornerstones of, um, of, of the government's priorities to, um, to kind of transition uh, towards a, uh, our electricity system into which is something which is cheap, clean, and reliable. So this forms a very core element of our uh, government achieving net zero emissions by 2050. And how we're we doing it is basically on the slide, you will see probably there are heaps of benefits. So there's obviously going to be private investment up to 32 billion by 2030. There are going to be jobs, but more importantly, the plan is that this uh, roadmap is, is expected to kind of save about $130 per year on average electricity bills for New South Wales residents. 
we achieve, uh, I think the plans under the, under, we'll be achieving it through those five phases. So the first one is uh, actions is around renewable energy zones, which are kind of a geographical location of strong or probably renewables uh, such as solar and wind generation. And they're kind of a modern day power station. So when they combine, they kind of act as uh, a, a, a storage base of, of renewable energy sources. The other uh, action which under the roadmap is the pumped hydro recovery build grants program, which is kind of incentivizing investment in feasibility and, uh, and, in, and development of new infrastructure on pumped hydro and other renewable energy sources. And the other kind of uh, initiatives which are kind of addressing the uh, the, 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 I would say the barriers which are faced by the market, which kind of include providing them with certainty, uh, de-risking and also providing access to capital as well. Um, there's heaps of information on the website. So there are certain initiatives uh, where which are open for public consultation as well. Um, so I highly encourage you to, I'll share some links towards the end of the slide to have a look and read more about this roadmap as well and how you could engage. The other initiative, uh, which was highly publicized again earlier this year, is the New South Wales Electric Vehicle Strategy, um, which was, uh, so basically from starting coming this Monday, that is from 1st of November, if you buy an electric vehicle, you should be able to claim a $3,000 rebate or and get a stamp duty on eligible vehicles. Uh, in the coming weeks, you would also be, uh, there will be an expression of interest being launched to seeking uh, organizations or councils who would be interested in hosting um, the charging infrastructure stations in major regional towns as well. Um, and in addition, there will be a $20 million of additional funding, or there is additional $20 million funding, which will be made available for destination charging. So that would be for businesses which are located on tourist, tourist drives in regional locations who could actually apply to host those kind of electric vehicle charging infrastructures. Other initiatives under these uh, electric vehicle strategy include uh, uh, supporting private fleet owners to transition to electric vehicles, um, as well as providing the electric vehicles to, to exclusive access to transit lanes like T2 and T3 lanes as well. Um, and last but not the least, one of the other actions which again this year, which was launched is the uh, New South Wales uh, uh, Waste and Sustainable Materials Strategy, which includes uh, a plastics action plan as well. So what it does, it basically sets uh, uh, targets, which are in addition to what are uh, what are the national waste policy targets. So on the left of your screen, you see some of the targets, which are uh, the national waste targets and which has been adopted by the state, state government. In addition, on the right, you see some additional targets, which the New South Wales government has set, which include reducing litter and emissions from organics to landfill. Uh, earlier this year, uh, sorry, I think just a couple of weeks back, uh, the government has also introduced the uh, plastics reduction and circular economy bill into the parliament, which will kind of prohibit the supply of certain elements of plastics, but at the same time also set specific stand design standards for plastics and other materials as well. So again, this is something what the government is doing in the uh, waste sector towards helping the economy transition towards uh, net zero emissions. Um, over the last couple of slides, it was just a very quick overview, but um, these are some of the links. So the environment.nsw.gov.au, energy website, there's energy saver website, highly encourage for you to have a look. And these are my, uh, this, that's my contact details as well up on the slide. So thank you. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kartik. Appreciate that. Great overview to put the context, set the context for the discussion for this evening. Uh, can I just say, we've uh, great to see the questions coming through. Can I just say that the webinar will be available? We'll, it is being recorded and it will be available in a day or so through my website or social media. We'll, make, we'll send out a post to let people know about that. So that's a question that people have asked. So I just want to uh, close off on that. So thanks for raising that issue. I should have mentioned it right at the start. Okay, so it gives me much pleasure now to introduce our second speaker this evening, uh, and that's Carly Hood, who is um, in charge of the program at Wagga City Council. Uh, Carly's a very keen uh, advocate for the work that she does, and she's going to be talking to us about some of the work that she's been doing with uh, Wagga City Council. 
Uh, so, Carly, I might hand over to you. Thank you for joining us. Thanks very much, Joe. Just get my screen shared here. Okay, is everyone able to see that all right? I think you might want to change your mode, Carly. You can see the presentation format. Right. Yeah, we're just seeing the... Yep. Let's get out of there, shall we? Try. Oh. Always great when these things work in testing. Yeah, that's right. Not, <laughs> not on the night. That's all right. Uh, just. Uh, we'll try again. Try again. Yep. Good on you. What would life be like if it worked perfectly? Oh, that's right. Mm. Okay. Right. How are we going there? Oh, good. good. Perfect. <laughs> right. Let's get a move on. Uh, so thanks for your introduction, Joe, and for your presentation, Kartik. Um, the state is doing some really great work in this space, and it's fantastic to see. Uh, so I'm wanting to give everyone a brief overview of what's happening locally. So although Joe's already provided a lovely acknowledgement of country, I would also like to pay my respects to elders past, present and future of the great Wiradjuri nation. So Wagga City Council has actually been on this journey for some time now. In 2008, we signed the New South Wales Mayor's Agreement on Climate Change, where we pledged to reduce our emissions. Shortly after that, Council set a number of environmental targets, the primary overarching one being to reduce our emissions by 20% by 2020, and we did achieve that. So Council has also, importantly, acknowledged the need for further action in this area through our local strategic planning statement, and through the adoption of our net zero emissions targets. So this is what was adopted just a short while ago. So we have aligned with the New South Wales target, and now we can finally say the Australian target of net zero by 2050. And for council itself, we adopted a corporate net zero target for 2040. So obviously the key differences here are the scale of the issue, and how much council can realistically take action on and have impact on in that space. So one thing is abundantly clear though, in order to reach any sort of net zero targets, they need to be backed by all levels of government. And it also needs business, industry, and the whole of community to get on board as well for it to be successful. So let's delve into what council is up to in a little bit more detail. So Council's focus lies in these key areas. Where things are well out of our sphere of control, we can still at the very least advocate and play a role in helping form the narrative from state and federal government. We need to continue to collaborate with other government agencies, business, industry and the community wherever opportunities arise. Education is obviously an important factor. And of course, we need to be able to lead by example and demonstrate sustainable practice by getting our own house in order, so to speak. And that's what we're hoping to do with our corporate net zero strategy. We're gonna be focused in, in on these areas that you can see on the slide, solar PV, renewable power purchasing, waste management, energy efficiency, all of that to try to reach net zero by 2040 at the latest. So this is a snapshot of where we are now. Our big ticket items are electricity and gas as well in all of our facilities, the city street lighting and our fleet. But it's important to note that once we include the community's waste to landfill and all of the legacy emissions from that, the landscape changes quite a bit. So while council own and operate the landfill, obviously it's the whole of the community that are generating the waste that's going there. So local initiatives, as well as the circular economy and sustainable materials policy and initiatives that the state are doing are gonna be really key to reaching targets around waste. So here's a brief overview of some of the actions council has been taking with more of an inward focus. So there's energy efficiency, solar, 
different fleet initiatives, including developing a transition plan to get us towards a zero emission fleet, renewable power agreements that we're looking at, and lots of tree planting and so on for carbon sequestration, but also for the co-benefits to local biodiversity, which is also really important. And some of our actions with a bit more of an outward focus, there's the LED street lighting upgrade that's recently happened. FOGO is a really important one for us. The active travel plan and the Wagga integrated transport strategy and the collaboration with the state on the Bowman Special Activation Precinct is another big thing. Unfortunately, I don't have the time tonight to go into a lot of detail around all of those, but you can always send me questions that I can give you follow-up information. But they're all playing a part in our transition towards net zero. So importantly, what can you, everyone in the community do? Well, quite a bit actually. In addition to advocating to all of your government leaders to take action, you can help educate your friends, your family, your neighbours, your co-workers, and you can all directly reduce your emissions too as part of your everyday life. So the pyramid on the left here is showing the avoid, reduce, offset hierarchy, and that can be applied in different ways and varying degrees by basically everyone. So you can see on the right here, our community emission snapshot, and it shows that electricity is by far the biggest piece of the pie there. Every single household and business can take steps that will impact on that. So of course, not everything is applicable or feasible for every single person and every single situation, but you get the general idea. Simply asking, does that heater need to be on? Or does that not light need to be left on? Well, if the answer is not really, turn it off. Avoid using that electricity to begin with. And if you think, no, it does actually need to be on, that's fine. But can you put a jumper on and turn the heater down by one or two degrees? Can you put in a more efficient light bulb? Can you put solar on your roof? Maybe you're a renter and you can't do that. Can you look at purchasing green power instead? There's lots and lots of things that you can do. They all help reduce emissions. And a lot of them usually save money in the long run as well. The same sort of thing applies to waste. Not creating the waste in the first place is the best thing you can possibly do. So asking yourself questions like, do I really need to purchase that item? Is it made to last? Can I try something secondhand? Is there an option with less packaging? Is it made from recycled or sustainably sourced materials? And when it's time to actually dispose of it, thinking about what you are doing. Can it be reused in some way? Can it be recycled? The very least that you can do is put it into the right bin. So for example, our council curbside audit of the rubbish bins, those statistics show that a lot of households are still throwing food into the red lid bin and that's sending it straight to landfill. So that will now sit there and generate emissions for the next 30 or so years. So every little thing that people do can make a difference. The same principles apply for transport. Wagga does have some public transport. I know it's quite limited, but you need to ask yourself, can I leave the car at home and catch the bus? How about using the new active travel paths and taking the bike instead some of the time? If you're heavily reliant on cars, you could try carpooling. You can also choose to buy the most efficient vehicle that you can afford. It's not going to be a Tesla for everyone, but maybe it's a hybrid vehicle or just a smaller, more efficient car. Thinking about the total cost of ownership and not just the initial purchase price is going to cut emissions and save money in the long run. Um, okay, I've just looked at the time and I'm going a little bit over my allocated time here. So I'm going to leave it there and hand over to Alex to talk more about the amazing opportunities on the horizon for transport and electric vehicles in particular. Thank you. 
Thanks, Carly. That's uh, fantastic. Appreciate the work you've done on that and appreciate the work you're doing with the Wagga City Council as well. Lots of thought there for discussion and we've got quite a few questions coming through, so that's great. And as you mentioned, uh, now gives me great pleasure to introduce Alex Kelly from the Electric Vehicles Council. Alex has stepped in at the very last moment and very much appreciate you doing that, um, Alex. And uh, you're going to talk to us a little bit about some of the exciting options developing in terms of transport. So I might hand over to you, Alex. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Carly, Gatti, great presentations and thank you for having me. Let's get this going. How's that? Good. So the Electric Vehicle Council is the peak national body that represents the electric vehicle industry. What that means is we work with governments at a federal, state and local level to develop policy to accelerate the transition to electric vehicles in all forms of road transport. So when we talk about electric vehicles, we're not just thinking about private vehicle ownership, we're thinking about all the other different modes of transport that can utilise electric vehicles and reduce emissions in Australia. To give you some context globally of what's happening with transport electrification, at the far left there, you'll see Norway has just hit 80% market share in electric vehicle sales this year. On the other end of the scale, you'll see that Australia is just sitting at 1.4%. So we really have quite a lot of work to do in accelerating electric vehicle uptake. When we talk about net zero emissions, transport and electrification is a very important piece of the puzzle, particularly because Australians are keeping their vehicles for up to 15 years. What this means is that by 2035, we really need to be buying the last internal combustion engine vehicles to reach those targets. We're slowly getting there. So you'll see in this graph that in 2021, year to date, so this was a graph from June, we've already exceeded the total sales for 2020 in electric vehicle sales. So it's positive. We're starting to see progress across the car market in terms of consumer attitudes and purchasing behavior towards EVs. We expect that these numbers will be significantly higher um, given the introduction of subsidies from various state governments and the deployment of charging infrastructure to assuage concern and range anxiety from consumers about their ability to charge electric vehicles. What we know already is that Australians want electric vehicles and approximately 50% of respondents to our consumer attitude surveys show that they would like their next purchase to be EV. Consumers understand the environmental benefits, but similarly understand that there are other benefits towards electrification. Personally, I think health should be a little bit higher than 11%. I mean, we don't really consider the poisonous fumes that we're breathing in that come from our exhaust. And so more of a narrative in drive from a health perspective will, I think, change the way people are thinking about what kind of cars they're driving. Still, this is all well and good, but we've identified there are still significant barriers to uptake. The higher pur purchase cost of an electric vehicle means that there isn't yet the opportunity for everyone to be able to afford these vehicles, which is why programs such as those introduced by the New South Wales government are really important to raise awareness and bring that purchase price down. In terms of public charging infrastructure, fast chargers will support the public network and home charging infrastructure is actually where most people will do most of their charging. So about 80% of charging is done at home, but a lot of consumers believe that they'll be charging like they do at a petrol station. The dialogue is changing from moving and driving to consume fuel and refuel into one of convenience. No longer do you have to go to the petrol station to recharge. You can do it when you get home overnight so you're ready for your trip the next day. Electric electrification is one part, as I said, of, of the decarbonisation puzzle. And I think COVID has presented us with an opportunity to really look at how we plan our cities and towns, moving away from a town that's designed for vehicles and one that's designed for the community and residents. So while we advocate for electric vehicle uptake, it's not that we want every vehicle that is an internal combustion engine vehicle to be transitioned to an electric vehicle, rather we want the community to start looking at different ways they can support their transport needs, be that active transport, so cycling, electric bikes and walking, or where it's necessary to have a car to consider those more emissions reducing and healthier vehicle options. 
Similarly, as we plan future cities and as we look at transport plans, such as the Wagga Wagga plan, how do buses and public transport fit into that puzzle? How can we design city centres so that we can support electric transport and reduce passenger vehicles in our centres as well? So the mobility ecosystem is changing and I've alluded to, you know, micro mobility, bikes, scooters and that kind of thing. But we're seeing the emergence of other modes of transport where electric becomes a support mechanism to make sure it's a decarbonized and proactive use of people's transport needs. Things like ride share, so using Ubers where you need to, perhaps you don't need to own a private vehicle because you actually don't drive that much. Mobility as a service, so multi, multi-modal forms of transport. Can you get the bus to the train and will that fulfill your transport needs? Connected and autonomous electric vehicles and future transport modes means that you'll be able to real time understand where your transport options are and they'll be delivered to you as they have been described. So innovation in transport solutions is making it easier for us to consider not using vehicles such as cars all the time, and particularly whether we need to own vehicles ourselves. Can we consider other options if we're looking as an individual to reduce our transport emissions? By 2030, and interestingly, 49% of respondents think they'll be driving an electric vehicle by 2030. But as I alluded to, we really need that number to be significantly higher. And that's because we need to start seeing a decline in the number of internal combustion vehicle sales at that point. So by 2035, we're not selling them anymore. In other nations, they have got targets to ban the sale of diesel and petrol vehicles by 2030. So there is a difference in what targets exist, but at a national level, a lack of EV strategy is really limiting Australians' ability to choose to go electric. I've got this slide here because I think it's really important to demonstrate there is actually a lot happening in this space. I think EVs are still considered a bit of a spaceship technology to most Australians, despite that, as you have seen from my first slide, in a lot of other markets, they're actually becoming the priority choice. So local governments have been leading the charge and congratulations to Wagga Wagga on their electric vehicle and plans for fleet transition. But I think there's still more to be done at a state and a local government level to really drive and accelerate change in our communities. So what can we do? Residents, you've got a role to play in encouraging and supporting and asking your governments to do more. So at a, a local government level, talking to your councils about what fleet transition they have planned, whether public char charging infrastructure can be deployed at community centres, at sports grounds, what transport emissions reduction schemes are in place. We've seen that there are some plans there. And so it's just about really demonstrating support for those schemes so that your councillors and so that your public servants can do more to support what you are after. Similarly, switching to green electricity or installing solar so that as you switch and use electric vehicles, using a decarbonised form of energy to refuel your vehicles, basically meaning you might be charging and using fuel for free in the future and similarly reducing your total cost of ownership over the lifetime of that vehicle. Local governments. I think a really important part of your role is to educate residents and deliver consumer awareness campaigns, drive days. As I mentioned earlier, EVs are still spaceships, but we need to really demonstrate and make residents familiar with the technology so that they're encouraged and inspired to make the change. So providing visible access to charging infrastructure, building cycleways is as part of the transport plan, looking at e-bikes, trying to encourage other modes of transport, be that through cars or active services so that your residents have a choice and they don't have to drive the internal combustion engine that they have been traditionally using for the last 15 to 20 years. Finally, I think there's a lot of room for innovation in the sector um, and in transport completely. So how can we get energy and transport working together to deliver new ways of moving around and how can we plan our cities to support all of these different options? My final slide is just another plug for other, other organizations and companies that have started moving towards electric. So you'll recognize a lot of these companies. Um, we've even started seeing electric trucks into the market. So it's not a spaceship anymore, but it's about understanding and being aware and considering what that switch can do for you and your community. And that's it from me. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Alex. Uh, thank you very much. That was uh, that was great. So now we get to uh, a time when we uh, will go through our questions and uh, as a bit of a Q&A for the panel. William, um, do you want to say, do you want to kick off the questioning perhaps to our panellists? Okay. Um, uh, the, some of this has been addressed in your presentations, but uh, what is a key action the community can take and, and what's stopping the community from doing that? Might start with uh, we might start with uh, you, Alex. What do you think? The if you had one thing to pick uh, for the community to take, what do you think it would be? At the moment, I think it's consider EVs as a viable option for your next your next vehicle purchase, and and look into what that means. So understand and compare your fuel costs and how much you're spending. And measure that with what an electric vehicle could save you because there are total cost of ownership benefits but they're not well understood so it's about educating yourself as well as asking your governments to support you so that you can make those informed decisions and use the subsidies such as the new south wales government subsidy to make those purchase decisions as you are able to and, and alex one of the questions that we've uh, had asked through uh, the slido here has actually uh, commented that the rebates and incentives that the government have, have made are great, but they haven't been widely publicised. And of course, I think the legislation is actually pretty recent. Are you, aware, would you agree with that in terms of the need for a campaign around those sorts of uh, benefits or incentives? Yeah, so I think what ended up happening with that bill actually was it was meant to be tabled before we went into lockdown in New South Wales. And so it actually got delayed till a couple of weeks ago. So they weren't sure on implementation dates. At the moment, the program it launches on Monday. So if you are a consumer, you will be able to access that. But I think consumer awareness around that program, it is something that we do need to deliver from a government perspective, particularly People don't know that there's money out there for them to use, and I think they, they really should. So there does need to be more to make consumers aware that that is available to them, definitely. You know, you're absolutely right. That that bill that brought those changes in place was actually with the budget bills in June. Yeah. And the day after was the day of uh, Minister Marshall and the COVID scare and the uh, in the in the parliament of course it hasn't met till two weeks ago yeah. so that that actually is part of the explanation but clearly it's a message for me about publicity and making people aware so that's good so william can i pick up your question and, and go to kartik now so Kati, what do you think would be the one thing the community could do yeah i think um uh, i would say i think i don't want to make it technology technology agnostic and just say i think it's more important that the community engages with the initiatives or the programs which the councils or the governments do. So be it any education or the rebates, I think that's the first thing. And then by engaging, I mean, I think I'll build on what Alex said is educating because that's a first step to anything because there's so much of information out there on transition to net zero. Most of them is accurate. There is still a lot of, could be some misconceptions as well. What's suitable for your household, what's not. So I think it's understanding, educating yourself and your neighbors and your family I think that would be the first step I would suggest to just start there. And Carly, would you, can you give us a, an answer to that question? What do you yeah, think is the, look, the one thing you'd pick? I couldn't agree more and it is difficult to pick one thing, but making informed decisions is really crucial. There's a lot of information out there. The blessing and curse of the internet is that some of it is misinformation or incorrect information. So being properly informed and educated is so important. And also for people to have some belief that, that they can actually make a difference because it's such a large global issue. A lot of people think that, well, what, what can little me do? There's no point in me doing anything. And that's not true. So actually that point about access to accurate, reliable information, boy, have we ever needed that. As COVID's taught us anything, it's been the importance of having access to that. So, so yeah, absolutely good point. William, would you like to ask another question before we well uh to alex and carly um, just to what what could uh, state government do to facilitate and remove barriers to uh, some of these things we've been talking about and would like to see more of alex, I what do you think the... yep oh carly yeah actually that's <laughs> carly 
local government's normally getting a whack, so now you can have a whack at the state government. Oh, yes, yeah, that's right. On. No, actually, um, I really want to acknowledge that there's lots of great things happening in that space in the state, um, more than ever before, and certainly a lot more than at the federal level. Um, so a lot of the things I want to see are actually planned, although at a high level, in the net zero strategy that the state's released. So that's great. Um, now, I'm actually a big fan, and this is my personal opinion, not an official August City Council opinion. I'm a big fan of mandating certain things to simplify matters for everyone concerned. So an example for that is, you know, energy and water efficiency requirements for buildings. So at the moment, um, we have basics, but that's at a fairly low level, let's be perfectly honest. And the approach is to say you have to meet this really low bar and beyond that, it's all up to you to decide what you want to do. But at the end of the day, we see vast majority of people choose to just meet bare minimum and things where, so an example is in Wagga, we've got a lot of new housing development going on. About 50% of these people are still choosing to have a black roof for their house. So something as simple as choosing a white color would make a huge difference for that asset that they're going to have for the next 40 years. So I'd love to see uh, the state take a, a bit more of a, a stringent approach on what minimum standards are for things like that. Same goes with um, our energy and water labelling schemes and whatnot. It's great that they're there, but people have to understand what, what they're about, what they mean. And then at the end of the day, if you still want to choose to buy a two-star rated dryer, you can. Whereas if we weren't importing that product in the first place, people wouldn't be looking to buy that. I guess a part of the key, one of the key things you've touched upon there is, is information. So, you know, making people aware that there are differences depending on the colour of the roof you buy. Uh, and uh, uh, I agree with you about the need for making sure that the labelling is clear, but maybe we actually need to go another step uh, further on that. Um, Alex, do you have any comments about what you think the state government ought to be doing? Yeah, I mean, I similarly would like to acknowledge that the New South Wales Zero Emissions Plan is, is very good compared to the rest of Australia. I mean, over half a billion dollars has been committed and that was probably not something we expected to happen even 12 months ago. So the development of that strategy is really going to drive and accelerate adoption. But I think that's the baseline. So that's where we're starting, but we always need to do more. And I think working with industry and community to develop further policy. So look at supporting electrification in other vehicle segments, for example, trucks and micro mobility. How can we provide access in New South Wales to e-scooters? How can we encourage people to move away from private vehicle ownership onto public transport? Will have a significant impact on reducing emissions, I think. Yeah, no, thanks, Alex. William, you and I talked about uh, not just state government, but uh, local government. And I'm wondering whether we might uh, get Kartik to hazard a commentary on what he thinks local government could do. What do you think? Kartik? Sure. Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, basically, I think, look, the kind of three phased approach I could think of where the local government's role becomes more critical. I think first is obviously leading by example. And, and I think it's... Uh, and Wagga Wagga Council has already done, taken that step by having an operational target. And I probably could use some stats, but I think there's, I think the department did a survey probably last year or something with the councils and about two thirds of the council have started on the journey of having an operational plan or an operational target to transition to net zero. And then that kind of leads into a community emissions or community wide plan to, to go head towards a, a, a net zero target as well. The second stage, which I feel is more also around programs and support, I think that's equally important. So it could be either uh, mini scale rebates at for the low, for the rates payers or people who are living within the uh, council area, and um, and more importantly, because finance is often not always but often a barrier to for adoption of any new decarbonization technology. So that's something which could add more value and it could complement a lot of programs which the state government is doing as well. So uh, for example, if state government has, has incentives on the EVs, there could be an opportunity for councils to explore other areas where there may not be enough incentives or for, for the rate payers. And also I think to 
the last thing I also feel that is the whole education and the peer-to-peer uh, exchange of information. I think that's the biggest role council could play where state government is kind of one step away. Uh, but I think that local government has continues to have that direct con- contact with the community and its residents. So that's the biggest influence the local government could have. Well, I just can- make a comment. Yeah, sorry, Alex, can I make sorry. a quick comment? I think we're talking about local government and state government as separate, like what can they do as individual, but we can also work together, I think, and that's an important part of this is how can local government and state governments work together to deliver the outcomes that the communities are asking for. So where we do have, you know, charge infrastructure programs or we do build cycleways, how can we increase community awareness for the state government through community programs via the local government? And I think that relationship can really help drive and educate consumers and residents, but also it's a healthy working relationship. And and so identifying issues and challenging them and innovating together will build an easier path forward because there'll be less regulatory barriers, there'll be less challenges and unforeseen obstacles, I suppose, because everyone's kind of on the same page. And I think that's a really important part of planning for the future as well. Yeah, Alex, I don't know. I don't know, getting government to work together. I don't know if I get my mind around that one. No, but actually what you were saying, uh, so Kartik has said three areas, local government, uh, lead by example, programs and support and information. And clearly they could partner with state government by programs and supports that match state initiatives. And clearly in terms of information, local government, you're right, close to the people on the ground and could you know work with government in those areas anyway? So so good point and something I need to take on board. And, Look, and Joe, just... I think if so, if I can just add, but I think there's definitely initiatives already underway. So I think there's some programs which work oh. as part of like sustainability advantage, or there are other programs which are a kind of a collaborative approach between department and. Uh, local councils as well. Obviously there's a lot of opportunities to improvise and how we could work, but yes, that's something in progress. So we could definitely explore those as well. And I, and I think, I actually think uh, the state government has produced some resources to support local government. So there is also a role for us, I think, to encourage local government. Look, I'm going to go to some questions that have come through so we don't run out of time. There's some tricky questions here. Um, and the first one uh, is, comes from Des, but it's been upvoted. And can I just remind people that they can upvote questions if they want them um, uh, answered. But the first one is in relation to a question that I've uh, had raised with me, and that's the, actually the cost uh, of removal and replacement of solar panels. Now, uh, this is a criticism that's often made, uh, and of course, people think it's many years down the line. Kartik, do you have any commentary to make on that? Is that something the government and the department are considering? Uh, as far as I'm aware, probably not. I think uh, in terms of removal, removal and um, and and I'm not sure if the question is is it about disposal as well. But I think that too is yeah. Yeah, I think the issue is that um, we're building a whole lot of solar farms all over the country. Um, and has anyone thought about what what what's going to happen to the solar panels when we finish? And I know the local councils. I know the Rerock have put a paper to the government seeking a contribution actually from developers so that they will have the funds uh, necessary in you know, 10, 20 years time to undertake the necessary disposal. Uh, I don't know if you've got anything that you'd like to add on to that. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I think there's probably, I would probably admit, I think that's probably, it's a sector which is not as evolved in terms of recycling of solar panels or probably replicating, but I think it's kind of evolving as we speak. And I'm kind of envisioning that the current, the New South Wales material circular economy bill, which is there, it, though it's, it addresses a specific element, but I think that has a lot of potential, the strategy as well, um, which the New South Wales government has, has an opportunity to kind of explore into that area as well. So it's in kind of evolving field. And I admit probably it's not as advanced as what we would have all like, but uh, hoping, I think, fingers crossed, there are smaller initiatives that private organizations who are actually looking into it. And there are already some recycling industries or companies who are taking back solar panels and kind of ripping off all their uh, glasses or other materials and trying to recycle them as well. So that's underway, but it needs to improve. I think thanks for that. And I'm going to make a note of that um, issue. Uh, I just want to go on to um, the next question, uh, which is, uh, well, it's been, what is the state government 
doing an anonymous question. What is the state government doing going to do to get more energy efficient houses and have them built with sustainable house principles? Uh, Kartik, you might be again the person. Carla, you might come in on that. But Kartik, do you want to? Sure. Have a yeah, I think there was this uh, uh, state environmental planning, the SEP. Uh, and the building codes review, which was kind of underway. So it's currently under review. Uh, the exhibition, uh, I think the initial phase of comments, which were kind of due, uh, which was completed earlier this year, as far as I remember. And then there are um, second phase of, I think the exhibition is probably scheduled for later this year, early next year. So I suggest, I think that's underway as we speak. So there probably would be, could be good opportunities there in terms of improvement. But I would also like to flag that under the net zero strategy and the plan we kind of there's a program which we're kind of looking into or probably is underway is looking at how we could get low carbon materials being used in the building sector so highly encourage again if you want to have a look at the website the program is called low emissions building material it's not exactly directed at the resident but it's kind of targeting at the sector as to how really we could help the industry to overcome those barriers in using low carbon materials and make use of sustainable materials into building homes and businesses and other uh, sectors here. Thanks, Kat. Alex. Sorry, add something on, as well when we talk about building codes and new developments, it's also to think important to think about the new technologies that will be using those buildings. Because we built a house today, it lasts for 40 years. And if we have the targets and we reach them for electric vehicle uptake by 2035. That means a house built today needs to support future transport technology. And so building codes were a really important way to make sure that those houses and buildings are EV ready. So instead of someone buying a house and having to expensively contribute to the introduction of electric electrical infrastructure, let's do the time of build and that means you're saving a significant amount of money. And by putting that into the building code, you're actually requiring that developers build the capacity at that stage, rather than the person buying the house having to expensively retrofit when they buy an electric vehicle in the future. So getting houses uh, ready, ready for electric vehicles exactly. right now and, yeah. and building that into the codes. Yeah, exactly. And that is being done to some degree at a national level through the National Construction Code, but I think there's a role for state governments to build on that. The National Construction Code is, is kind of the baseline, and then the context in different states really provide the opportunity to build more efficient and EV-ready homes of the future. Well, that that would require the state governments working with the Commonwealth Government, Alex. So, uh... <laughs> I think Even harder. Yeah, I think, <laughs> no, I, don't, I think the National Construction Code trickles down, right? Yeah, and that should build on it. It trickles down. You have to kind of all do it, and then you can make it more stringent in your state through the state government mechanism. Yep. No, thanks. Yeah, absolutely right. Uh, look, I might, uh, William, if you don't mind, I'll I'll read to the next question. It's a bit of a plug for the Crow Group here, William. Community groups like Crow and Juni Community Power need funding to empower the community on emission reduction. Any ideas on how to gain that funding, funding for community groups? Any thoughts from the panel on that? Carly. I want to put in a little plug for Water City Council's annual grants program. Uh, so I have a, a small category there and it's funding available annually for exactly that kind of thing. So make sure you touch base with me. Thanks, Carly. And I've got a grants guru on my website and you never know what you can find. There's actually a, a range of grants available to organisations and encourage community groups to, to look through what's available in that area. And that's an important uh, commentary. So I'll certainly take that on board. The next question is, what action can be taken to reduce the overuse of plastic wrapping in what we buy? And uh, Kartik, you mentioned uh, the Plastic Reduction and Circular Economy Bill, which yep. was uh, brought into the Parliament last week, which I think will be a major step forward in this area, but will require, uh, I think, a lot of community education and support. Do you do you want to make some comment on that? Absolutely, yeah. I think, um, and look, I think over the last 10 years, I could say 
a lot has progressed. And I don't know if m- most of you have noticed, but behind your bread packages or behind, uh, or probably in your cereal box, you now you see something called a red cycle logo. So basically all those flexible plastics, so any plastic which actually you can crush within, within your palm, can actually be stored and you can actually drop off at some of the major retailers. I know Woolworths and Coles are kind of at this stage collecting those materials and you could just, and that actually gets treated and gets converted into some reusable plastics like, you know, uh, uh, park benches or bollards and other materials. So that's a practical initiatives and a very, uh, something you could just really do it. So highly encourage. I think most of the brands are now on board and they're kind of having that uh, recycling uh, label inserted on their back of their uh, brands and stuff. So I think you can easily read it and actually do it. It's pretty easy. I think this bill is going to also tackle single use plastics and in fact, take steps to make sure they're not, they're not available if there's a reasonable alternative. Correct. Yep. Well, that will be I think, well, that will be a big step, but I, I get a sense that we will need to do quite a lot of work with the community uh, to get people used to that because um, so much of what we uh, use gets used once. Uh, yeah. And uh, from, from, well, takeaway food uh, containers uh, all the way through to, and, and of course, straws and so on. So there's a bit of community ed- education in that. That's part of an introduction of an, a, an approach to a circular economy which I think is very important. And Carly, I think you highlighted that in waste being an important component of uh, how we can actually reduce emissions and actually make our lives better for everyone. Um, the next question is um, refers to the fact that many people want an electric car, but they're still expensive and there's little assurance or support from the government. Uh, and it's a plea to make all subsidies and cost savings clear to everyone. And I think Alex... You'd probably agree with that, uh, but I think we have covered that off. Do you want to make any other comment on that? Yeah, I, I think there's a role for federal government to play in that as well, right? So in other markets, in California for a period of time, you could get up to $20,000 off your electric vehicle purchase because you had a federal level subsidy and a state level subsidy. So New South Wales is filling the policy void by providing a subsidy at a state-based level to reduce the cost of that vehicle. But similarly, it's why engagement with your MPs is really important at a federal level to say this is something that we want, particularly from the regions, I think. It it, it can be a controversial topic, but it it really isn't if the constituents are asking for it. And the only way for parliamentarians to know is if you're telling them. So I think there's an important part to play there in government, providing the education and awareness of the campaigns that exist, but also of residents to tell them what they want. So, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Um, I'm, I'm going to, uh, I hope with the permission of the person who's, uh, persons who recently has asked a question about uh, support for building new houses in terms of actual construction materials. I'm just going to skip that because there was uh, a question here about the government's support for people, put, people putting on rooftop solar. Uh, and that that support has been removed recently. Uh, well, not recently, actually. I think it's actually been decreased for quite some time. However, my understanding is that the uptake of rooftop solar has been extraordinary and is expanding uh, really almost uh, exponentially uh, across, as people turn to it because of the price factor, I think. And that as an incentive, uh, it's not perhaps needed, I suppose, that would be the argument. It is a very important point, though, because, of course, as someone else has pointed out in the chat, we need green power for the vehicle, electric vehicles. There's no point having electric vehicles if we're just uh, uh, fueling them with um, uh, coal. So, of course, we do need access to sufficient electric power. And there was another question here saying, will we have enough clean energy in the future? And would anyone like to finish off on a comment about that, including yourself, William? future of will we have enough green energy in the future uh, and uh, the uptake of solar and the response well, of the community? Well, just on, on the one point of w- whether we'd have enough, I mean, there's uh, one of the uh, barriers to uh, more renewables coming into the system is that it's in, um, creating so much 
uh, energy just during the middle of the day when there's not the same demand. So if we can coordinate the the um, charging of the EVs, and I think there's quite a bit of work being done on this, how it's it's it can really um, the EVs can support the the uh, the grid, you know, by soaking up the excess solar that can come into the system because there's a demand for it during the middle of the day, you know, perhaps by uh, having charging available at workplaces and the like, and then. Um, and, and there may even be the option, uh, the vehicle charging back to the grid at the peak time. So that's one point. Yeah, good point. Would anyone else like to make a comment on that yeah, issue? Can yeah, and, and I do look, um, I'm probably the concern is similar. To, my views are very similar to what William has said. The concern is not about whether we have enough renewables or not. I think we have seen in states like South Australia where they have been touching significant amount of renewables on a day. I, can't, I don't exactly remember the percentage, but it's it's kind of growing every day. But the challenge, as um, we mentioned, is the demand management as to like, you know, the solar or any renewable source is only for a specific time of the day. So for example, solar is during the daytime, wind is only on specific windy days. So if you don't have a wind, if you don't have a solar, it needs to be how do you want to, so batteries come in place, but then there needs a demand. So it's, it all comes down to the whole demand management and how it's controlled as well. So to answer that question, we, we absolutely have sufficient renewables. It, I think would be a question of how do we manage the demand, the demand management side of things. And of course that, that, that requires management of the backup power, firming capacity, and also the capacity to share electricity across Australia. I mean, South Australia is frequently got almost give away uh, electricity. Uh, we just got to get it to where it's needed in the Eastern Coast. And of course, some of the big projects being developed to renew the grid will allow that to happen. Alex, I don't know if you want to make a comment on that before we finish. Yeah, I think when we consider the future of energy and transport, it's a convergence, right? So electric vehicles are actually going to support the grid by storing that excess solar that we're talking about. And the EV industry is built up of electricity providers, of vehicle manufacturers, of charging infrastructure providers who are all working to solve that challenge right now. So it's not that it's a forgotten issue. It's actually something that's being considered and technologies such as vehicle to grid mean that you'll actually be able to absorb excess energy from the grid into your electric, ba electric vehicle battery, store it until such time that the grid needs it again. So there's a supporting role for electric vehicles and their batteries to play in energy transformation, as well as transport emission reductions. I think that's a good note, Alex, on which to uh, conclude the webinar. Can I thank everybody who's presented this evening? Thank you, Alex, uh, Carly uh, and Kartik. Really appreciate your presentations and taking the time to join us this evening. Uh, William, thank you very much to you and your group. Very much appreciate uh, the inspiration for this and your involvement in helping us plan this. I'd also want to thank Adam Bannister from the Pyrus Group, who's been doing the engine room behind this for us, and Rochelle Kell from my uh, staffing, who's been helping me, helps me with community engagement. Uh, Rochelle, thank you for your help. And on that note, uh, I'd like to wish everybody a, a wonderful evening. I hope uh, this seminar has brought you some useful information, has got you thinking about what is going on. Uh, some of it's actually exciting, and it's actually to be honest, uh, better than I thought it was, uh, certainly a couple of years ago. It's good to see that things are moving, uh, but we still got more to be done. And for that to happen, of course, we as a community and as individuals need to keep pushing on that. So being informed is part of it uh, uh, and advocating and taking action is the second part of that. And I encourage everybody to do that. So thank you very much. I've certainly got a lot of information this evening that I need to uh, follow up on my behalf of adv advocating for the community. And I appreciate the questions that have come through and people's attendance. And again, thank you to all the presenters. And on that note, I will say good night to everybody. Good night. Thank you. Good night.